In case some of you don't know and haven't watched my other Dark Souls lore videos, King Seeker Frampt is not the only primordial serpent. There is another named Darkstalker Koth. It is difficult to find him because one must defeat one of the harder bosses, the Four Kings, early in the game. After doing so, Koth reveals himself in the Abyss and shares a shocking truth to the player. The linking of the fire, which we have been tasked with for the entire game, is a sin against nature. A sin that began with Lord Gwyn. For every Age of Fire, there must be an Age of Dark, an Age of Man to complement it. Lord Gwyn, quote, trembled at the dark, and feared the Dark Lord who would one day be born amongst humanity. And so Lord Gwyn began the linking of the fire so that the Age of Dark would never come about. This act is what is known in Dark Souls as the First Sin. Putting it simply, if we link the fire at the end of the game, we act against the interests of nature and humanity. Darkstalker Koth reveals two other truths in his monologue. Of the four souls that were granted to the four lords, one was considered a dark soul. This dark soul was divided up by its owner, the furtive pygmy, in order to birth humanity. Whether the term humanity in this case refers to the humanity sprites, the humanity phantoms, or the human species is presently unknown. Nonetheless, as quote-unquote humanity multiplied in number, the three lords who received the, let's say, light souls, did all they could to keep humanity under their control so they may not usher in the Age of Dark. When I first learned of these truths from Kath, I started to ask myself questions that nobody else seems to have posed. Why was it that, of the four lord souls, one was dark and three were light? Moreover, why was the Dark Soul associated with humanity? Also, why did the three Light Lords, and in particular Gwyn, have such animosity towards humanity? As with my three previous videos on Soulsborne lore, I looked through religious literature to see if I could find parallels to Dark Souls' story. While there are plenty of stories about malevolent gods subjecting humanity to their destructive whims, there was one particular religious tradition that echoed Dark Souls' themes and motifs more than any other. That tradition is Gnosticism. I will link the examples of Gwyn and the Dark Soul to Gnosticism in a second, but before I do, I need to give a general overview of what Gnosticism is. Gnosticism is not exactly a religion, but a collection of religious ideas that originated around the first century AD. Its ideas featured a mixture of both Christian dogma as well as one's internal psychological experience. It was the mixture of both that would supposedly elevate one's consciousness to holier planes of existence. This focus on personal spiritual knowledge was a process known as gnosis, which of course forms the root of the word Gnosticism. It was the process of gnosis which offended the early church fathers so greatly. They feared that if people did not receive their spiritual knowledge from the church, it would lead them away from the path of righteousness. As a result, most Gnostic material ended up being destroyed by members of the Orthodoxy. For a time, the only knowledge of the Gnostics that the world had were critical works by members of the Orthodox Church. The most famous of these works were Against Heresies by the Greek bishop Irenaeus and The Elenchos by Hippolytus of Rome. It was only in the mid-20th century that the Gnostic library grew larger after texts were rediscovered in the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi. I will detail one Gnostic myth for you in a moment, but before I do, let us not overlook the parallels between the Gnostic persecution and the actions of the Three Lords in Dark Souls. Every effort is made by the Three Lords to perpetuate the Age of Fire, and to prevent the Chosen Undead from learning about the truth of the First Sin. As well, every effort is made to ensure that worship was directed exclusively to them, and nowhere else. Any of the other characters in the game that challenged Gwyn's hegemony received vicious punishments, one of which we will discuss momentarily. But first, I will present to you what is arguably the most famous story from Gnostic tradition, the Pistis Sophia. I will simplify this story for the sake of time and clarity. In Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic theology, there is a feminine spirit known as Sophia. 
She is seen as the personification of God's wisdom, a concept that is most famously discussed in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8. The Gnostics took this concept of Sophia and applied it to their own theology and cosmology. She dwelt at the border between the material and immaterial worlds, between the void and the heavens. Now, depending on which Gnostic you talk to, there are several tales about what caused Sophia to leave the immaterial realm and enter the void. In the most prominent version, Sophia wished to create something within the material realm without the consent of the higher powers. After descending into the material realm, the light that she brought along with her mixed with the darkness. As a result, the material universe was birthed. Before her return to the heavens, she birthed a child, a lesser god known as the Demiurge. Ignorant of his origin, the Demiurge surmised that he was the only god and thus created the seven planetary realms, equated with Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the Moon, and the Sun. Having been birthed in the dark void, the Demiurge was as imperfect as the creatures he ruled over, though he was ignorant of that fact. When humans displeased him, he would act out in wrathful ways. For some Gnostics, the Demiurge was often equated with the God of the Old Testament, with his destructive actions in the books of Genesis and Exodus. The existence of an imperfect Demiurge was the Gnostic solution to the origin of evil, and an explanation for the suffering of man. Now, the first and most obvious parallel that we see with the Pistis Sophia is that of the Demiurge with Gwyn. Like the Demiurge, Gwyn assumes the role of a supreme god and rules his realm in a way that causes human beings to suffer. Not only the human NPCs, but the players themselves vis-a-vis -vis Dark Souls' famous difficulty. If the beings he ruled over did not submit to his ways, they would be punished. His origins are as incomprehensible and ineffable as the supreme god of Gnosticism, given that we only know who Gwyn's uncle is, that being Allfather Lloyd. But even then, Lloyd's identity as Allfather or Uncle, or that he even existed at all, is in doubt. One other thing that I forgot to mention is that the aforementioned Hippolytus described the Demiurge as having a fiery nature, which lines up nicely with Gwyn's status as the quote-unquote Lord of Cinder. Secondly, Sophia's descent into the void and the resulting birth of the cosmos reflects what we discussed in my video about Dark Souls' creation myth. In that video, I talked about how the animating power of the first flame reflected the animating power of the Christian Logos. In the Christian myth, the spirit of the Lord, or Logos, went out into the void and birthed the universe. It did so by separating all the opposites that laid within the darkness. For example, by separating light and dark, sky and earth, fire and water, the world and the universe were formed. The first flame did the same thing by creating, quote, disparity, heat and cold, life and death, and, of course, again, light and dark. In the Pistis Sophia, we see similar motifs. The spirit of Sophia goes out into the void and births the universe. However, the Gnostic creation story shares a slightly greater similarity to Dark Souls over the Christian creation story, because both the Gnostics and the game account for an imperfect demiurge. Thirdly, we see an association of the dark with humanity. In Gnosticism, the dark is associated with the material, imperfect world, and the formless void it came from. A void that is, in some ways, interchangeable with the abyss, as well as the prima materia, which we discussed in my first Dark Souls video. It is because humanity was birthed in the dark, in the void, that makes it almost impossible for them to reconcile with the light, much in the same way that fire cannot reconcile with water. The Demiurge, viewing himself as the only god, wrongly associates himself purely with the light, just as the three lords did. By the way, is it not interesting that of the four lord souls that three were light? A holy trinity of sorts? Not only does this line up with the holy trinity of Christianity, but the holy trinities of other religions, like the Hindu Trimurti or the Buddhist Trikaya. And to top things all off, humanity factors into these trinities as what Jung would call the incommensurate fourth. Humanity lives far beneath the heavenly pleroma, wishing to reconcile with the gods, and thus turn the incomplete trinity into a wholesome complete quaternity. I understand that the last few sentences might have seemed like nonsensical gobbledygook, 
However, to go into greater detail regarding the psychology of trinities and quaternities would be a video unto itself. If you'd like to hear more on that point, let me know in the comment section below. There is one other potential association that I forgot to mention. As I said before, the process of Gnosis was part of the journey to higher planes, to the Pleroma from which Sophia emanated. In order to achieve Gnosis, they combined scripture with psychological experience. The conclusions that were made, such as the existence of a demiurge, were done by intellectual discernment, rather than pure faith in scripture and the church. In Dark Souls, we see this battle between intellect and faith acted out most prominently in the character of Velka, the goddess of sin. In the Dark Souls lore, Velka's purpose was to dole out punishment to anybody who sinned, and this included the gods. Just like the Gnostics wished to be freed from the rule of the Demiurge, Velka and her followers rebelled against the three lords, and particularly Gwyn, for their involvement with the first sin. For her quote-unquote transgressions, it is widely theorized that Velka and her followers were banished to the painted world of Ariamis. One interesting thing about Velka is that the sorceries one can perform while using her talisman are done using intelligence. In contrast, the sorceries performed while using Gwendolyn's catalyst, Gwendolyn being the son of Gwyn, are done using faith. Before I conclude, I just want to remind you all of something I said in the last two videos. My belief is that the Soulsborne games are amalgamations of pre-existing myths. What will inevitably happen when mixing different stories is that some things will stay the same and some things will differ. If I evoke a religious story or some other story and try to compare it to Dark Souls lore, do not dismiss it if one or two details don't line up, although I nonetheless welcome you to point out those details. Instead, Try to focus on whether or not the overall patterns line up. There will be more videos like this, linking the world of Dark Souls and Bloodborne to our real-world myths. For now, do me a solid and hit that like button, please. Hey, it's Christmas time. It's the season of giving. And it's free to do as well. <laughs> Seriously, please hit the like button, it helps out my channel more than you know. Obviously subscribe if you want to see more Dark Souls videos in the future. Also special thanks to Preeminent Enigma, Robbie from the Nerdy Nomicon, Maxi Gertling, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, and Lucy for looking over the script for this video. In particular, thanks to Thani for helping me with the Gnostic elements of this video, and finally, as always, thanks again to Elisa for doing the thumbnail art. If you'd like to see more of her work, click on the link in the description box below. Until next time, just remember, stay yellow.